Hello and welcome. In this unit, we'll discuss eligibility for special education. Our goals in this unit are, one, to learn the legal definition of eligibility in the special education context, and two, learn the requirements needed in order to be eligible for services. Many parents we encounter don't realize that having a disability doesn't automatically guarantee special education services. In order to receive special education services, a student has to be eligible to receive those services. That means a student can technically have a disability, but not qualify for special education. Let's discuss what this means. Can you think of some examples where a student with a disability might not qualify for special education services? I'll give you one that came to mind. A student in a wheelchair. The student has a disability, but their disability doesn't affect their educational needs in terms of accessing what is being taught. Of course, the student might need help accessing the school building or activities at the school. In this case, they might benefit from something called a Section 504 plan, which we'll cover in a later unit. As you can see, special education services are meant to provide services for students that need additional assistance to access their education. That is, if they don't receive special education services or related services, they will not get a benefit from their education. Indeed, when the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, was passed into law, the law specifically gave several reasons why it was created stating that for too long children with disabilities faced many difficulties, the law was created to right several wrongs. The law, as examples, gave the following big picture issues which included students. One, not receiving appropriate educational services. Two, being excluded entirely from the public school system and from being educated with their peers. And three, having undiagnosed disabilities which prevented a successful educational experience. IDEA, as a law, is meant to remedy those big picture problems. But before a student is able to fall under the protection of the law, they must be eligible for those protections. So let's begin with the discussion of the law. In order to be protected by the law, a student has to be found eligible for special education. But what does that mean? For our purposes today, it means that the student meets three different prongs of the test. And they are as follows. Number one, the student is less than 22 years of age. Number two, the student has one or more of the following disabilities. Intellectual disability, hearing impairment, speech and language impairment, visual impairment, emotional disturbance, orthopedic impairment, autism, traumatic brain injury, other health impairment, or learning disability. And number three, the student needs special education and related services. We'll discuss these shortly, but I want to take a second and just make sure this sinks in. In order to qualify for special education services, the student has to meet all three prongs of the test. It's not enough for a student to have a disability they must also be within the correct age range and need special education and related services. That means that some students may have disabilities but may not qualify for special education. Of course, that doesn't mean they're out of luck, but what it does mean is that IDEA won't protect them. If the student is no longer 22 or under, they might get protection from Section 504 or the Americans with Disabilities Act. If they're in the right age range but do not need special education services or related services, they might receive specialized accommodations and modifications through Section 504. Again, if a student is to be protected by IDEA, IDEA, they must meet the eligibility requirements of the law. Let's begin this discussion with the first prong, the age requirement. This seems simple enough, right? Well, as you might know, special education law usually isn't simple. The law states that it protects students if they are less than 22 years old. So what does that mean? It basically means that to receive services, a student must be 21 or under. It also means that a student can be covered if they are very young, even two or three years old, 
since the law gives a maximum age cap, but not a minimum age. Technically, some students with disabilities may receive services before they enter what most of us consider the traditional school age of five years old, or the age when students typically start kindergarten. These early intervention services, which will be provided through Regional Center, are actually rights found in a whole other part of the IDEA law, so we'll not cover them here. But it's important to see how the law does cover children who are very young. The coverage only stops when a student ages out of special education. As I mentioned earlier, this happens when a student turns 22, but it might also happen earlier. In California, this largely depends on whether a student graduates from high school with a diploma or a certificate of completion. Do you know the difference between the two? A diploma means that a student has graduated from high school and completed all of the requirements to do so. For example, completing the necessary units, achieving the necessary grades, and passing any required tests. With a diploma, a student can continue their educational career. In order to be admitted to most colleges and universities, a student must have a high school diploma or equivalent, like a GED. In essence, the diploma says that the student met the academic standards and rigors of high school. Certificates are not diplomas. They're given to students who have attended high school but did not meet the necessary requirements for a diploma. For example, a student may be enrolled in a school but will not complete the necessary units to graduate with a diploma, so they will be given a certificate of completion. This isn't to say that certificates are bad. Some students might genuinely benefit from being on a certificate track and might not be able to complete a diploma but certificates do have limitations. For example, some jobs will not hire students if they only have a certificate. More importantly, many colleges will simply not enroll students in a degree track if they only have a certificate of completion. The colleges that do enroll students, such as community colleges, often allow students to enroll in classes, but require students to get their GED before they're awarded an associate's degree. Okay, the point here is that if a student receives a high school diploma, they no longer qualify for special education services. They will no longer meet the legal requirements of the law, even if they are in the right age range of 22 and under. However, if they graduate with a certificate, they may continue to receive services up to 22. Let's discuss the second prong. In order to receive special education services, a student must fall within a special education eligibility category specifically found in IDEA. And yes, I know this is confusing because we are discussing eligibility in this unit as a big picture legal idea, but the law also uses the word to mean categories of disabilities. I will use the word eligibility in this section as the law means it, categories of disabilities. The eligibilities you see on your screen are listed in the law but are not a comprehensive list of the disabilities that are protected by IDEA. These eligibility categories are used as umbrella terms that capture many more disabilities. Students may be considered disabled even if their disability is not listed here as long as the disability can be put under one of the eligibilities that are listed. In this unit, we're not covering the specifics of each eligibility. That will come later. But for our purposes now, the recognized eligibilities are intellectual disability, hearing impairment, speech and language impairment, visual impairment, emotional disturbance, orthopedic impairment, autism, traumatic brain injury, other health impairment, or learning disability. As I mentioned, we will cover these eligibilities in later units, but for now, let's discuss why a student has to fit into one of these eligibilities in order to receive special education services. Essentially, it's because the law is protecting only students who have disabilities that fall into these categories. That means that the law, as it was intended, specifically wanted to protect people 
who have certain disabilities. If there isn't some sort of evidence that states that a student has a disability that can be grouped under one of these eligibility terms, then the student will not be protected by the law. For example, if a student has chronic asthma, they might not fall under any of these eligibilities, and as such, they will not be protected by IDEA. Okay, the final prong is that the student actually needs special education services and related services. If a student is the right age and has a disability, they still need to show a need for services. What would be an example of a student who meets the first two prongs, but not the last? Well, remember when we discussed a student in a wheelchair? In this example, special education services will simply not help him or her because they don't need services to access their education. Later, when we discuss related services in other units, you'll see what services are available and how they help students access their education. As you can see, eligibility is a bit confusing, but a student essentially needs to meet all three prongs of the law in order to receive protection from the law, in this case, specifically IDEA. Let's discuss a few things that are unique to eligibility. Many people think that when you're speaking of eligibilities, such as autism, you're speaking about a medical diagnosis. That's not the case. Eligibility is a legal construction, so a medical diagnosis is not required in order to be eligible for special education. In the vast majority of cases, an evaluation is done by a psychologist who will recommend an eligibility, and that recommendation, not a doctor's note, is what is necessary to be eligible for special education and special education services. However, some of these eligibilities could be triggered by a doctor's recommendation. Let's revisit our eligibilities. Which ones of these might actually require a medical diagnosis? If you said traumatic brain injury, I think you might be correct. This eligibility might require more than what a psychologist would be able to capture in an evaluation. However, all the other eligibilities would likely come from a recommendation made by an evaluation. Notice I said recommendation. Since eligibilities are legally constructed concepts, parents actually have the right to accept or deny eligibilities recommended to them. This discussion would happen at an IEP meeting, and it's an important tool for parents to know about. For example, if a parent receives an evaluation and it lists an eligibility that might make the parent feel uncomfortable, such as emotional disturbance, the parent can ask for further discussion and possibly remove some of the recommended eligibilities they don't agree with. My last note is that in California, some eligibility categories are expanded. For example, California uses deaf blindness and multiple disabilities as categories. This doesn't mean that a student with this eligibility has been found eligible incorrectly. California has expanded eligibility categories, and these two are ones that are used at the state level. One question that we often receive is how many students fall under each eligibility. What you're seeing now are the number of students in California public schools with disabilities in the 2014-2015 school year, which was the most recent information available when we filmed this unit in 2016. As you can see, the range in numbers is quite enormous. From only 116 students in the whole state with deaf blindness eligibility to almost 290,000 students with a specific learning disability. This difference in numbers doesn't mean one eligibility will lead to more services than another, nor does it mean that those with more students will lead to better or more services. Overall, 10% of kids in school have a disability. Of course, some districts might not challenge eligibilities that are obvious, such as blindness, but all eligibilities should lead to services. With that, we'll end this unit that focuses on the meaning of eligibility. For more general information about eligibility, please watch the other units we have on the specific eligibility categories we have on this website. You can also access our toolkit online and read Chapter 6 on eligibility for more information. Well, thanks for joining us, and goodbye.